All right, so we're gonna close out our chapter. This is the last lesson of chapter four. And we're closing it out by talking about just a couple topics that are really important in terms of realizing what you can do and what you can't do with the results you get from a study. So this first slide right here talks about a huge topic, really, really important topic that you need to understand very well called scope of inference. Scope of inference is one of those things that after you leave my class, after you go on to be an adult, hopefully this is a topic that you will remember because it really, really matters in terms of what you can do with results that you get from a study. And it's something that the average adult doesn't understand well enough. And it's something that if you're reading articles online or different things about just studies that you see, people who write articles frequently mess this topic up and misapply the scope of inference of a study. So I have a little bit of a table here at the bottom. I'm gonna go ahead and delete that though. Oh, can't delete it right now. But instead of filling out this table, what I'm gonna do is have you guys write down just the key points of scope of inference off on the side somewhere in your notes. There are two things that we are concerned about with regards to scope of inference. We care about whether or not our data came from a random sample, and we care about whether or not we had random assignments. These two factors are what you need to consider in order to decide what you can do with your results. Random sampling from a population means that you pulled your sample randomly out of the entire population. Everybody within that population had a chance to be chosen for your study. If you randomly sample, you can apply your results to that entire population. If I take a random sample of adults in St. Louis, I can apply the results from those adults to the entire population of St. Louis. Couldn't apply it to the rest of the US because I didn't sample from the rest of the US. Those people didn't have a chance of being chosen. So random sampling allows you to make inference about the population. Inference means basically making predictions and stuff like that. So random sampling allows you to talk about the population. All right. Random assignment, on the other hand, is when you break people up and you create roughly equivalent groups in an experiment. So if you have roughly equivalent groups due to random assignments and you see a difference between those two groups, you can assume that th that difference was because of the variable that you manipulated. Random assignment allows you to make conclusions or inferences about cause and effects. So if you wanna say that one variable causes another one, it has to be an experiment where you have random assignments. If you wanna talk about the population, everybody, you need to have random sampling. Most experiments that you see and hear about are not able to be applied to the whole population. Why is that? Well, for experiments, when you're talking about some college research lab or something like that, they don't randomly pick people out of the population and be like, you, you're coming to be in my study. I selected you randomly. Most experiments rely on volunteers or people who sign up to be in the studies right there. So those people that are volunteers are probably not representative of the population as a whole. First off, a lot of people who are like subjects in experiments are college students. They're a very common audience right there because they're in a university anyway. They can get extra credit in their classes, maybe get a little extra money. So a lot of experiments who are performed on college kids, they're typically younger, healthier than the average person in our population. So we can't apply the results that we see in college kids to the rest of the population. If we're taking some group that's like high cholesterol risk and we're doing an experiment on them, we can only talk about how this drug works in people with high cholesterol like the ones in the study. So the disclaimer you usually see in an experiment is that the results can be applied. We can determine that this medication caused the benefits or the whatever, but we can only apply it to people like those in the study. So it's like a little disclaimer in most experiments that you will see. So what this table is doing is just summarizing what I've been talking about right here. Were they randomly selected? Were they randomly assigned? If you are randomly selected, that means that you can make inferences about the population. 
okay? So were they randomly selected? Yes. Yes, you can talk about the population. Yes, you can talk about the population. If they are not randomly selected, that means that you cannot talk about the population. Were they randomly assigned treatments? If yes, then you can talk about cause and effects. And if no, you cannot talk about cause and effects. So you can see parenthetically right here, most experiments fall into this group. You can't make inferences about the population because they're mostly volunteers for the study, but you can talk about cause and effects. A lot of observational studies fall over here where there was a random sample. You can talk about the population, but you can't talk about cause and effect. Flashback to one of our earlier lessons where we looked at smoking compared to ADHD rates in children. That wasn't an experiment. So what we could say in that context is that it appears that smoking is connected with higher rates of ADHD. Those two things go together. And if you smoke, you're probably also gonna have a higher risk of having a kid with ADHD. But we can't go that extra step to say the smoking caused the rate of ADHD to increase because of confounding factors. We don't know what's actually responsible for it. Newspaper articles mess up scope of inference all the time. You will see studies all the time where maybe the researcher knew what they were doing and the researcher didn't do anything wrong. But some journalist who reads it or some person who wants to make their BuzzFeed article about whatever, doesn't understand scope of inference, so they incorrectly interpret the results to say, oh, this caused this. We'll look at some articles where that happens in class. So what I have here is just an example to practice scope of inference here. We're gonna test whether listening to music while you work um, impacts your, I think it's going to be grades in school, GPA at the end of the semester, okay? And what I have right here is four hypothetical designs, and we're just going to talk really quickly. These are pretty easy questions. Once you understand scope of inference, where can we apply our results, okay? So the following slide right here is where you can write these down, but I'm just going to do it on the slide so I don't have to tab back and forth. I'm going to write it right here. Okay, so we are going to take everybody in our AP stats class and we are going to have them be in a study, ask them, hey, do you guys listen to music or not? And then look at GPA um, at the end of the semester. So I let you guys decide, do you listen to music? People who say yeah are in this group. People who say no are in this group. End of semester, we would look at them. Okay, so we did not randomly sample. We used an AP stats class. We can't talk about the whole population. So we can't talk about whole population, only this class. So if there is a difference between the two groups, I can say in this class, kids who listen to music do better or do worse, that would be fair. But I can't apply my results beyond my classroom because I didn't randomly sample. Okay. I also didn't randomly assign you to groups. Since you were not randomly assigned to groups, that means if there's a difference, I can't say it was because of the music because there could be other confounding factors like um, maybe kids who like music are um, more motivated or less motivated and you can run all those hypotheticals. So we can't talk about cause and effect either. So we can't say the music caused a difference. The word caused is a very powerful word in AP stats. Don't use it unless you actually have cause and effect. You can talk about things being linked together or there being a connection, but mentioning effect or cause is a really strong statement that you should not do unless you are randomly sampling. Okay, so this is how I would want you guys to write your answers, but I'm going to write them a lot shorter in these next couple examples to not slow things down right here. Now, in this second scenario, we are randomly sampling from our school. And then we ask if they listen to music or not and break you into groups. So I did randomly assemble. That means I can apply to the population of my school. Can't apply beyond my school because I didn't use people from other schools, but I can apply to the whole school even if I don't talk to every single person. But there would be no cause and effect. So I could say the same sort of thing. Can't say that music caused a difference because I just let you establish your own group, same as the first one. All right. Next up, get everybody in AP Stats class. So you guys are my captive audience. You're in my study. Now I'm going to randomly assign half of you to each group. 
random assignments should make it so the groups are about equal in all those different factors you could think about. So if there's a difference, I can say it's due to the music. So this would be a no for the population, but a yes to cause and effect. And then finally on this last one right here, this is like the gold standard. It's a random sample from my school and I did do random assignments. So I could make conclusions about both. This is generally unrealistic in most experiments. Like I said, experiments tend to live here. Observational studies frequently live here. So the last thing I believe I need to talk about with you guys. Oh, two things. Okay. First of all, this is an article we're probably going to read in class, but it's kind of interesting. Um, based on taking vitamins and the connection that vitamins have with your overall health. Turns out that when you do experiments where you actually randomly assign people to take vitamins or not, there's usually not too much of a difference in health outcomes between the two groups. Vitamins don't tend to do a lot in terms of your overall health. But if you do an observational study where you don't do random assignment, you just look at data, people who take vitamins tend to have better health outcomes than people who don't. But it's because of confounding factors. If you're taking vitamins, you probably care more about your health. You do other things like exercise, diet, et cetera, that make you have those better health outcomes. So if you're not careful, you can very easily run into an issue where those confounding factors make you think something is causing a situation when it's actually not. And the very last thing, that we have to talk about in this chapter. It's quick, but it's important. Being ethical in collecting your data. Just something that we have to talk about here um, because you guys will be running your own project later on this semester. Whenever you collect data, you have an obligation not to share that data with people outside your studies and keep things confidential. You have to be upfront with people. You can't lie to your um, the people in your study and you can't be like, oh, this person said this on their survey. And that's just not an okay thing to do. Um, when you, if you actually go into a career with research and you violate these principles of ethics, you can actually be like blacklisted from the um, like community. So you can't actually participate in research further. Um, all studies, if you guys do any like high level statistical studies, you'll submit them to a review board and they'll make very certain that you're not breaking any guidelines there. So use common sense and common decency when you guys do your project for me later this semester, results do need to be kept confidential. So that is the end of our first unit on experimental design.